Welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India at Bank of Baroda Mughal Tent. We are delighted to introduce COVID Health Literacy and Healthcare. The session is a presentation, is presented by the Embassy of the United States of America in India. One of the lessons of the pandemic is that access to correct information is imperative. With misinformation, blatant propaganda, and faulty forwards from WhatsApp University floating around, we are combating not only a deadly virus, but a deadly mindset. This panel will discuss pertinent dimensions of the pandemic, health, literacy, and elements of physical and medical mental stability. We have uh, Sandeep Johar, who is a practicing cardiologist. He is also a frequent contributor to the opinion section of the New York Times. Chandrakant Leheria is a medical doctor, columnist, and author who has been at the forefront of COVID-19 pandemic response of India. Parkha Dutt, an award-winning TV journalist, anchor, and columnist. Amrish Satwik is a vascular and endovascular surgeon and a writer. Over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming here. I'm indeed delighted and honored uh, to be a part of this panel. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, perhaps the only true frontliner we have on this panel and indeed in this session is Barkha Uh Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been following her stellar reportage through all of this. She lost her father uh, to COVID and through all of that, and after that, she did not abandon her post. So I think we must all genuflect to her fortitude, courage, tenacity, and perseverance. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry, but we need to interrupt you for a minute. Uh, the session is to be introduced by Dr. Pita Rajaraman, and we just didn't place her because she wasn't on the <coughs> panelist walk, she was in the audience. So she'll start this session. Pita, welcome. I thank you so much. Uh, first of all, many thanks to the organizers for convening this very, very timely discussion. The topics of both health literacy and healthcare have always been important ones, but these are particularly relevant now as we witness in real time the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has taken such a terrible toll on all of us, no matter who we are and where we are in this world. Uh, and there is lots more to do, for sure. Uh, but I would like us to take just a moment to pause uh, and look at how far we've come. What a different place we're at than we were in March two years ago this time. In record time, we've developed treatments, diagnostics, and vaccines to counter what is completely new as a disease. The journey from research and development all the way to utilization has been faster than ever before, which involved the rapid expansion of laboratory capacity, new clinical protocols, and creations of digital systems for applications such as vaccine rollout and patient management. In fact, as of today, over 63% of the world's population has received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and over half has received a full primary series. So if we look for a moment just at India specifically, collaboration on health has actually been one of the oldest and most fruitful aspects of the relationship uh, between our two countries. Over the decades, uh, the US and India have tackled pretty much every global challenge that we've had, uh, whether that was the elimination of smallpox, battling the HIV epidemic, eradicating polio, and even on the other side of the coin, development of the first vaccine in India that protected against rotavirus, which is a common diarrheal disease in, in childhood. So continuing on this longstanding collaboration, we've worked very closely with our partners in India on COVID response and naming just a few examples specifically, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has been working at both national and state levels 
to strengthen outbreak response and the public health workforce, as well as disease surveillance systems, infection prevention control, and laboratory diagnostics. Through one of our longest standing programs here, uh, which has been uh, in force for over 35 years, our National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Many of you may know Dr. Tony Fauci, who's been the face of um, science over the pandemic for many years, uh, has been supporting the development of a range of new vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics to battle COVID-19. And in the meanwhile, our regulatory agency, the FDA, has been sharing information on the regulations of these new medical products. Um, on sort of the uh, high side or the more policy side, we've also been working through the Quad uh, and other similar fora to bolster regional vaccine manufacturing and supply. So all of these advances are, are great, um, but on a more somber note, we still face formidable challenges. In the initial stages of the ep epidemic, medical and public health professionals watched helplessly as our patients around the world succumbed to a disease which we knew very little about. There was no vaccine, no known therapeutics. But now in an era where we have effective vaccines, we have better clinical protocols, we continue to witness these illnesses, these deaths. Many of these should have been completely preventable. And it's really hard to express how tragic and how heartbreaking this is. We've successfully expanded manufacturing of vaccines, not only here in India, but globally. And yet the demand for these vaccines has dropped off, largely due to vaccine hesitancy, misinformation, disinformation, which have created confusion and lack of confidence. Similarly, many unproven therapeutics are still in use and simple public health measures such as infection prevention control are still not universally implemented. Also accompanying this pandemic, which has been very visible, has been the invisible mental health issues, both for individuals and for communities. We're also seeing chronic disease sequelae that we're only now beginning to understand the breadth and the magnitude of. The added layer of misinformation, which we keep coming back to, has further fueled the psych psychology and the mental health crisis. Finally, going back to the basics, the pandemic has reinforced the need to strengthen really our entire health ecosystem. Because if you look around the world, the places, the regions that were hardest hit were the ones where we didn't have strong health systems to begin with. So what does this mean? A skilled scientific and health workforce, efficient and harmonized regulatory approvals, not only the use of digital health, but also the systems that protect digital health, which means secure data, data privacy, strong supply chains, procurement mechanisms, and crucially important to ensuring the fair and equitable access of all of these, which brings us back to maybe uh, one of the main goals of this session, which is the communication and the information, which really enables all of this, which enables trust. And so with that, I turn to our speakers and who better to address these very, very important and urgent public health questions then a very prominent journalist who's been at the forefront of COVID-19 reporting, an epidemiologist and medical professionals who have witnessed this firsthand. So over to you. Thank you. Well, since the session is on false information and misinformation, let me begin with a story. Uh, King Frederick of Prussia, uh, wanted to introduce potatoes and uh, because this was the fallback option in case of uh, famine, nobody was willing to, to grow potatoes. The peasants, you know, no, no amount of inducement would, would, allow that, would make them grow potatoes. So he actually rebranded the potato, said that only the royal family is allowed to grow potatoes and uh, the farm will be protected by Guards, and overnight everybody else uh, decided, no, 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 there must be something in it, and and uh, we'll all go potatoes. So I was I was speaking to a friend of mine early on, and uh, when the vaccines were introduced, and he said, you know, uh, you should have tried something like that with vaccines. You should have actually leaked stories 
of celebrities and rich people queuing, jumping the queue and getting the vaccines. And that would have uh, made everybody think, you know, there's something there and they should have taken uh, the vaccine. But uh, how do you message to the masses, particularly in the middle of an ongoing pandemic? How do you get stuff inside of uh, a cross section of society? For instance, how do you address the monkey brained attitude of wearing your masks in your gym? Uh, would, would Dr. Leheria perhaps start and say, what should be some of uh, the basic messaging that you'd expect in a pandemic? So, thank you. We definitely are wiser with the wisdom of hindsight in two years of pandemic. What we have learned that the traditional approaches of uh, a billboard being in the corner of the city or a newspaper advertisement or a distribution of pamphlets are not going to work to change the behavior of citizens. How many of us change our thinking or our ideas simply by reading something on the billboard or uh, simply reading a newspaper advertisement? So one of the learning from COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, if we do our communication really well, it makes a lot of difference. People can adopt a better lifestyle or healthier behavior or including come up for the vaccination. So what is a better approach to uh, address misinformation or change the behavior? One of the thing is that we need to use in public health programs, uh, a more professional management approach where we try to understand what are the common concerns of the people. If people are not turning up for COVID-19 vaccination, why they are not turning up? And addressing those questions with the modern tools of science communication, health communication. In era of uh, WhatsApp or uh, Facebook or other social media, we cannot simply rely on the paper being distributed to the individual. So one of the learning is that communicate what people want to hear, communicate in their long language, communicate the message which, uh, uh, communicate on the platforms which people are using. And uh, of course, there had been challenges in science communication and COVID-19 pandemic in India, including in the mask wearing or COVID-19 vaccination. But if we look back uh, a year back or uh, two years back, definitely we have made a progress. And final point in this intervention is that, uh, of, of course, there have been challenges, there have been learning, but biggest failure in COVID-19 pandemic response or any country's response would be if we do not derive learning from the last two years to take actions in the future or to design our intervention, our strategies for the future, so we do not face the similar challenge for any other health condition. Our federal structure, uh, the state center relationship in India is, uh, is markedly different from what we have in the US. And uh, in our case, we found that uh, health is a state subject, but when you have uh, a national disaster and, epi and an epidemic diseases act in place, the center assumes all power. And uh, one of the things that happened in India was that, uh, the body that is responsible for uh, controlling, disseminating information and also surveillance and collecting data should have been the Na National Center for Disease Control, the NCDC. Uh, what happened instead was that uh, suddenly overnight, the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is a research body, assumed uh, that mantle. And it was doing everything from deciding who should be tested, uh, you know, who shouldn't be tested, tested, how should tests be prioritized. And therefore what you had was that you had no data. The hospitalization data was going to NCDC, the testing data was coming to ICMR. Uh, when genomic surveillance started, there was a separate silo created. Uh, and resultantly, if you wanted to know uh, if a patient infected with a certain variant was admitted where there was no way of getting this information because these this, the information was in silos. How did it happen in the United States? And uh, would you have some prescriptions for our country? Great. Well, uh, thank you for uh, having me on the panel. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there are lessons from the US uh, that, uh, you know, that we can discuss, uh, you know, I think the main issue in the U.S. has been uh, 
vaccine hesitancy. Um, and I think that has, uh, you know, inspired a lot of people to really rail against misinformation. And I'm actually very sympathetic to that attitude because, you know, I worked in a, uh, in a hospital that was not only the epicenter of the pandemic early, in the early days in, in the US, but actually at one point uh, had more COVID patients than any other hospital in the world. Uh, we, we, had, uh, we have an 800 bed hospital. We expanded it to a thousand beds. And at one point there were 950 COVID patients. Um, and um, you know, they were dying left and right. Uh, so a lot of what you saw in, in Delhi with people dying on the streets, we saw that in New York. Maybe they weren't dying on the streets, they were dying in their apartments, but they, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a huge mess. So, you know, I'm very sympathetic, but at the, same, you know, at the same time, I think we have to define the parameters of what misinformation is. Um, what exactly we fear and how best to combat it. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is that, um, as the first speaker mentioned, that, you know, there are a subset of people, especially in the US, who are never going to get vaccinated. No matter how much you tell them, no matter how much you present in terms of facts, um, uh, no matter how much you rail against misinformation, um, it is a very durable and fixed number. It's roughly one in six people. It's about 45 million people. So, you know, we can fight misinformation, but the reality is that you can't filter every misinformed posting on social media. That's just not possible. Um, in fact, I think the most adept algorithms will only filter out about 20%, 80% are gonna get through. So I think the question really is that Chandrakhan, I think ably pointed out is, is uh, maybe he didn't say this explicitly but, explicitly, but I will. I think the best way to counter false information is with true information. Instead of focusing on all the false information out there, I think we should focus on what is true and how best to communicate it. And at least I can tell you in the US, uh, communicating information with facts and graphs uh, and, and, and charts isn't gonna work. I think uh, our brains are designed to respond to stories. And I think um, uh, people who actually fight uh, information, not misinformation, but actually fight true information are very adept at telling stories that get people to believe things that are false. I think we have to work on developing stories to get people to believe things that are true. Uh, and and uh, so that, that's what I think is really uh, the main lesson uh, of the pandemic in the US and hopefully something that is uh, relevant to, to India. Barkha, uh, do you think withholding information is uh, misinformation? I mean, uh, for some strange reason, uh, the Indian Council of Medical Research till August or September wasn't willing to admit that we were in the middle of community transmission. Uh, what would you have to say about that? And you, you mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes even stressing very hard on technical terms related to the virus and its behavior could create confusion. Um, thank you. Uh, first, just to say uh, to Sandeep's point that I think if policy doesn't step in where misinformation thrives, whether it is the United States of America or India, uh, that only encourages more misinformation. And I know it's an unpopular thing to say to any public health professional, but I do believe that the American failure to mandate vaccines uh, actually sent out the wrong signal to the rest of the world. And, you know, I use the word mandate loosely. Maybe I want to say incentivize. Maybe I want to say link it uh, so much to daily economic activity that to not be vaccinated was not an option. Um, and, and I just think that what that did 
is that when you went into developing economies or poorer nations and you said, why aren't you getting vaccinated? And thankfully, vaccine hesitancy was not such a big battle in India. People would turn and say, you know, America may be there. Look at America. Look at the most powerful nations in the world. Even there, people don't want to get vaccinated. So there must be something wrong or dangerous with the vaccine. So I do believe that policy has to step in where information isn't working. Uh, to your point, no, I do not believe withholding information is the correct thing, no matter how concerned the government may be of causing panic. I think transparency of information always causes less panic. I think telling people the truth uh, and preparing them for the worst always causes less panic than leading them to speculate about what might the truth be on their own. But, you know, I want to just uh, take out a little example which persists to follow us from the pandemic into our daily lives today. There are restaurants even today uh, which won't give you a physical menu. There are restaurants even today. Like I notice it all the time. They'll ask you to scan your phone. It's totally arbitrary. It's totally ad hoc. And it's totally anti-science because actually we now know that COVID is airborne and it's not going to be uh, sort of more hastily transmitted if you touch the menu on your table. And it reminds me of the time that I first set out in the first wave, uh, sitting in a car and traveling 30,000 kilometers across India. At that time, we did not even know that masks were a priority and the emphasis was on wearing gloves because people used to actually believe at that time that fomites or surface uh, was the way that, that the virus would, would transmit. So a certain amount of misinformation when the world is trying to understand a disease is inevitable, but to not catch up with that information, to still encourage this idea of contactless delivery and kill our delivery boys and girls at Zomato and Swiggy for leaving bags outside and still be scanning QR codes and still be sanitizing nonstop during the day. Why are we doing this? Why have we not kept pace with the fact that we now know more and we can adapt to this? I'll just make a final point and I'm sure the conversation will go along. Misinformation has real life consequences. One of the things I observed while I was reporting on COVID uh, is what stigma. Uh, stigma did uh, to health workers at the front line. Uh, I found repeatedly that misinformation about how COVID could be transmitted, how it was something that you would be socially sanctioned or ostracized for, led actually to many people simply abandoning the dead in the first wave, leaving bodies outside the doors of hospitals, the gates of hospitals where good Samaritans across faiths were left to either cremate them or bury them. I reported on uh, doctors whose bodies could not be cremated or buried because as their families took them to these burial grounds, they were stoned, they were attacked with bricks. Uh, we forget today, as we sit here, emerging from the shadows of the pandemic, and thank God for that, what our frontline workers went through uh, as a consequence of the stigma. And finally, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the abandoned bodies that we saw in the second wave that, uh, that came up in large parts of the hinterland across along the river Ganga, there were two reasons for it. One was poor families didn't have money for firewood. But again, the second big reason was stigma. The stigma of being socially sort of censured in your community if you were COVID positive. And this crossed classes from your RWA, from your urban housing societies, where people punished you and asked you to leave the house, even if you were a brave frontline worker, to a poor family in a village in India. So information is everything in a pandemic. It is literally everything uh, because it really does have real life consequences. And I do believe that more information uh, and as information changes, communicating that change is imperative. Indeed, and, and stigma reminds me of the red sticker that was pasted outside of homes. Nowhere in the civilized world was that done, labeling homes as having someone who was infected with COVID. But I'm going to dispute your point in vaccine mandates. I dis disagree with vaccine mandates uh, because we don't have evidence in favor of that. You disagree even with incentivizing uh, or linking it to enough daily economic activity. We all uh, checked into our hotels having shown our vaccine certificate when we came to Jaipur. And I don't think there's a problem with that. No, it's, uh, there isn't. I, uh, the, the limited point I'm trying to make is that uh, excluding people from realms of activity because they haven't been vaccinated and not recognizing that natural infection also gives you an equivalent or sometimes a better level of immunity as compared to vaccines 
would be inappropriate. That's like telling people to go and get COVID. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is all responsibility. There isn't any evidence uh, that vaccines prevent transmission. The premise of a vaccine passport or a vaccine green pass is that vaccines prevent transmission. There's absolutely no evidence. Our conviction against anti-vaxxers, our, sorry, our uh, fight against anti-vaxxers should be based on evidence and not conviction. So I don't want to hog the time, so I'm going to say one sentence and then shut up. But, you know, when experts, even in the medical community, argue amongst themselves like this, for the ordinary person, it is extremely confused messaging. And that is what happened with this business of breakthrough infections. If you know that in the second wave, there was so much talk about, oh, breakthrough infections is proof that vaccines don't work. Whereas all the breakthrough infections meant was you can get COVID, after you've been vaccinated, but the chances are that you will not go to hospital, you will not go to ICU, and you will not die, which is what the job of a vaccine is. And I fear that when we all, and I'm no expert, I'm just a journalist covering COVID, but when we argue amongst ourselves over whether a natural infection is more effective than a vaccine, that is contributes to the lack of clarity among people here who may say, okay, I haven't got my second jab, maybe I don't need to. See, I... I, I, I sort of disagree with that. I, I, I think that, you know, people generally, generally are not stupid. Uh, and, you know, and I think we have this fear of <clears throat> complexity in public discussions. Um, look, I yeah, understand- Can you hold the mic I, closer? Yeah, there? I understand that there's misinformation, but there's misinformation everywhere in, every subject in, in every uh, um, uh, 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 strata of society on every social media platform. There's plenty of misinformation um, about climate change, but we don't really, at least so far, argue for censorship or oversimplification um, to, you know, so there's something special about COVID, right? Because people are dying, but climate change is also an existential threat but we don't really worry so much about misinformation um, uh, with, with regard to some of these other issues. So I guess what I would argue is that what is the best way to fight misinformation? Is it through censor censorship? Um, uh, you know, kicking people off social media platforms because they put something that you don't necessarily agree with? Or is it through presenting the opposite side and sort of what I would say, upholding the liberal tradition of encouraging conversation and having people, uh, you know, not fear it, not fear information, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's a far more effective way. You know, there, there is, an, uh, I'll say one more thing. There's, there is an element in the U.S., a very um, paranoid, um, polarized element that um, thinks that that the government is withholding information, okay, um, about vaccines and about uh, you know uh, COVID and so on. Uh, kicking people off social media platforms for posting something that you don't necessarily agree with, I just think feeds into that paranoia. At, at the end of the day, it's counterproductive. I think a much better way is to present things truthfully and with complexity and let people sort things out. Uh, absolutely. And, and the message we'd like to give uh, from this platform is that during any wave, uh, more than 90% of the patients who died and who were on ventilators were unvaccinated. So that should be your incentive to take the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Leheria, <clears throat> tell us a bit about boosters, particularly in the Indian context, because Again, the messaging here is quite vague. They're not even properly called boosters. They're called precautionary doses. Uh, one doesn't understand the semantic wisdom of using the adjective precautionary. Uh, and anyway, I think uh, we seem to be uh, more or less done with Omicron. So for those who are uh, entitled to the booster, do you think uh, they should take the booster? Is it gonna be of any help? Uh, is it going to protect them again, particularly the boosters that are available to us in India? I think you'll have to restrict your response to that. 
Thank you. So if we are talking about boosters, it itself proved that we believe in the vaccines and their protective roles. So now what is happening that we need to remember that in COVID-19 pandemic uh, or COVID-19 vaccines, each of the vaccine is different from other vaccines, the vaccines which are used in other countries, but also vaccines also uh, the protective benefit of vaccines is also dependent upon the local context and setting. So India's context or setting is that uh, we know after second wave in April, May 2021, nearly 70% of India's population had antibody, which essentially means by then vaccines were not sufficiently rolled out, people developed natural infection, and we know natural infection provides some protection. And since then, by now, nearly 95% of India's adult population has received at least one shot, 80% plus adult population has received both shots. Then third thing which happened in India is uh, Omicron wave, Sec uh, the third wave, third national wave in India due to Omicron. There are scientific studies that uh, during the Omicron surge, something like 60 to 70% of population once again got infection, though most of them were asymptomatic, 90%, 95%. So putting these three things together, second wave, 70% exposed, 95% adult population uh, receiving vaccines and third wave, we can fairly conclude based upon epidemiological evidence that uh, 97 to 98% of India's population has either protection, either after natural infection or vaccination. Now, what we need to remember that two shots of COVID-19 vaccines, no matter which vaccine it is, continue to provide protection from severe disease and hospitalization. Now, if the second wave or third wave happened, and we also know that if there is a natural infection, um, there are many international bodies say that uh, you are protected for additional, at least six months, probably for longer. So putting all of these things together, there is no rush to vaccinate or to, uh, there is no rush to administer booster shots in India and we should not be in rush. Yes, having said that, we need to remember that we need to protect the vulnerable. So 60 year plus population continue to receive booster dose, but for healthy adults, there is no urgency in my opinion, at least for a few more months and by then more scientific evidence will become available to administer booster shot in India. That's the one part. And second part of your question is, there is one more reason why we should not be rushed to uh, administer booster. We know that if a booster shot is administered on a vaccine, which is on different platform, what most countries are doing, they administered vaccines, viral vector vaccine, or any other vaccine, and then they mostly are administering booster shot of mRNA-based vaccine, or mRNA-based vaccine followed by mRNA-based vaccine. That works as a better booster. We know, and there are uh, Comboost uh, a study which say that if you give a mRNA-based vaccine after viral vector vaccine, there are 24-fold rise in the antibody level. If you give a same, uh, the protein-based vaccine, which is Corbivax and Covovax, it's an eight-fold rise in the antibody level. So if and when there is a need for a booster shot, it should preferably be on a vaccine platform, which is either mRNA-based vaccine or protein-based vaccine. Currently, huge vaccines have a limited benefit. So to summarize, to putting all of these toge things together, epidemiological evidence, scientific evidence, and the vaccines being used in India, while a booster shot is recommended for vulnerable 60 plus population, which continue to receive vaccine, there is no need to rush to administer vaccine boost booster shot to 18 to 60 population, and same is applicable for children. There is no need to rush for vaccinating children younger than 15 years. But can I just say, but, but the, the, the response to natural infection is very heterogeneous, right? That, that's, that's been the message of the CDC, in which, which is why they've really, you know, many people have concluded that getting vaccinated uh, is, has, affords more durable protection than actually natural infection. Well, yes. So the point is that what is being widely recognized in the scientific circle that hybrid immunity, natural infection, and then two shots of vaccine are really good amount of protection. We really do not know how long, but definitely minimum six months, possibly for nine months. So hybrid immunity situation, what India has, that's why there is no urgency to administer booster. But also scientists, scientists are working to understand, and it makes a lot of difference whether you receive vaccine first and then natural infection or natural infection first and then vaccine. So in India's scenario, where natural infection and second wave happened and then vaccines were administered. So India's situation is very different from rest of the country. And that's why scientific evidence say that we should not be in rush. In any case, 
every country determine their vaccination policy, including booster uh, shot policy, based upon their local evidence. So if United States or UK or any other country is doing, that simply does not mean the other country or India should be do, following the same policy. Uh, sometime before the second wave, there was this bogey that was introduced about Indian exceptionalism, the hygiene hypothesis that, you know, we've, we've had numerous respiratory infections. We're somehow much stronger. Uh, and for some strange reason, the first wave in India wasn't overwhelming. And a lot of people bought into that. And that largely also perhaps added to vaccine hesitancy because they were seen as new products that hadn't been adequately tested in the adequate numbers. Um, this theory subsequently has been uh, established as complete bollocks, uh, pardon my French. But, uh, but also the other sense that a lot of Indians get is that there is this hierarchy of vaccines that uh, somehow the first world, in quotation marks, seems to be uh, doing rather well with mRNA vaccines, and we've been given the sort of lower end vaccines. Uh, in fact, uh, the whole uh, virus inactivated vaccine did terribly in China and in Peru and, and even in Hong Kong. Do you actually believe there is a hierarchy of vaccines? I mean, it, <clears throat> I mean I'm not an infectious disease expert, and I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I, I, I've treated patients, uh, so I, I'm sort of in Berka's crowd, you know, I, I sort of read what the experts say, but, um, but I mean, I think there's no question that the mRNA vaccines are more effective uh, than, uh, than vaccines, you know, in, in, in every other platform. So, um, uh, so I mean, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, they, they have not, not only more effective in terms of preventing, um, yes, in some cases, transmission, but also in preventing um, severe disease, but also um, uh, far fewer, uh, you know, really adverse side effects like, uh, you know, brain clots and so on. So, um, so yeah, there probably is a, uh, a, a hierarchy. And I think the, you know, what, one thing that we have not done well enough uh, in the US uh, it's distributing these very effective vaccines uh, to other countries. I think there's been a lot of hoarding of very, you know, of these effective vaccines, um, and which is very problematic. And, and I think that uh, it's sad because, uh, you know, we have discarded vaccines because we've had such a hard time getting our population vaccinated because of vaccine hesitancy. So it's really even, you know, more, more shameful. But uh, with, with the media, uh, do you think that uh, anyone who was basically trying to question the official narrative provided by the state government or the central government uh, was seen as an antagonist and harming the cause? Uh, is it, it was, it was widely noted that uh, when questions were raised about uh, showing evidence from some of the vaccines that were going to be used uh, in our country, uh, such journalists were widely castigated. What would you have to respond to? So I think uh, there was a certain amount of nationalism in quotes that got mixed up with responses to the pandemic. And we were not alone in that as a country. I think even if you look at the United Kingdom, for example, the emphasis on uh, AstraZeneca, which was our COVID shield, uh, you know, was there till they eventually ordered their boosters to be mRNAs. Uh, so yes, firstly, I think in the second wave uh, at the outset, we overemphasized what may be called vaccine nationalism. Uh, we were very keen on a a vaccine that was developed and manufactured in India. And as it turned out, 88% of Indians were actually vaccinated with Covishield, which was manufactured in India, but not developed in India. Uh, that's on the vaccine nationalism end of it. And I think it was a kind of needless uh, sort of emphasis at the time of a pandemic to be measuring anything by some sort of uh, completely meaningless benchmarks of patriotism. But the other thing I've learned in, in, in being, you know, in my years as a journalist is that when it's 
PLU, people like us that are impacted by a crisis, our responses and our sensitivity suddenly changes and what we expect from the media changes as well. So let me give you an example from 2611. Before the 2611 terror attacks, uh, it was quite okay to, or permissible and nobody reacted badly to having families of, uh, you know, families who, who, who's, you know, where lives had been claimed by terrorism to talk about what had happened to them. But because 2611 hit our class, the relatively privileged class, suddenly people didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to watch it. And when the media started telling those stories, the media was called sort of scavenging on grief and so on, which had never been the media description for all other sort of terror attacks prior. I saw something quite similar take place in the second wave. Uh, this response came from people who had not suffered, but who were scared that they might suffer. Anyone who had lost a loved one, the one thing I found in common between rich and poor, rural and urban, men and women across caste, classes, genders, is that they did not want to be a statistic, they wanted their story told. But for those who had not actually lost somebody, but were fearful that they might in our class of people, suddenly it was very discomforting to see the images from the cremation grounds or the mass graves or the graveyards or the, it was just too close for comfort. And we suddenly found this sort of gratuitous judgment, um, which basically said, hey, the Washington Post and the New York Times didn't do this. So why are you guys doing it? Well, as a matter of fact, the Washington Post and the New York Times did report on unclaimed bodies, on, uh, 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 on sort of bodies that hadn't been identified, on how they'd had to be stored away in, you know, sort of warehouses outside of the major cities. Uh, and I do feel that a certain amount of psychological discomfort was understandable, but the rest was standing in the way of people's stories to be told. People, you know, I, I, I still remember and this happened to me personally, eventually, when I could, we couldn't find space to cremate my father who died from COVID. But before that, I was reporting these stories where, harrowing stories where I remember going into a cremation ground and there was a body lying on the bare floor and there was a man in a wheelchair sitting next to that body. And he was a disabled man, especially able man. He was waiting to get space. And I said, is it okay with you? Consent is critical here. You can't be filming anybody without their consent. So I asked him, would you like to speak? And he said, I would very much like to speak. And he told the story of what had happened to his brother. And a few weeks later, we actually had to get police help to cremate my father because the cremation ground was so crowded. And I just think that we, we're all patriotic Indians. We all care about our country, you know, just like everybody cares about their country. And to bring that somehow in uh, and as an obstruction to truth telling, to, to, to the stories of people who want to be counted, I think that is standing between the tragedies of people and their right to be counted. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll open this to Q&A a while. Uh, would someone please go around? I think the lady in the glass, uh, shades, please. Hello. Yeah, I'm Dr. Shalini Pandya from Ahmedabad. Uh, I have seen COVID last two years. And <clears throat> I need to tell you, Parkha, the media went overboard. You went into the ICCUs. And you create, you started treating the patients on, on media. You know, you talked about exiguous hydroxychloroquine. You talked about tocilizumab. You debated on them. And next morning, we had to answer hundreds of people about those things. We had to answer them about white fungus, black fungus. And apart from that, 24 by 7, talking just COVID created such a mental agony to the patients also. And those who are not patients also. I agree these stories need to be told, but not 24 seven, always on the media. First thing. Second thing is from US, they don't wear masks and they are not vaccinated enough. We did better. Whatever we say, after the second wave, we have done better. We have seen patients and I know where I was seeing 60% of my patients going into ICCUs or getting admitted in this wave, there are hardly any thanks to the vaccines. I have, I have myself got COVID twice in spite of being vaccinated. And I still tell you, 
get with you. I agree with that. And each time all of us as parents take our kids for BCG, polio, have you ever asked what are the vaccine side effects? No. Why are you asking COVID? What makes you ask that? Why don't you take it scientifically true? There are, as he says, there are so many studies proving it. So why do you talk about that 1% side effects and not the 99% of... I, do, I don't yeah. know who you mean by you here because if you noticed in the opening comments, I was the most pro-vaccine yeah, yeah, person. I agree, here, so. but Dr. Satya was saying something else. So I think we need to vaccinate each and every and we should make it mandatory because COVID is not about me, I, it's about the community. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And when I said that the incentive should be that you wouldn't suffer from severe disease and death, and not that you wouldn't be allowed to check into JP Marriott. That should not be the incentive. But anyway, uh, 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 the gentleman in the front here. Hi, thank you for the discussion. Uh, my question is regarding post COVID. Like we, we are almost at the end of this pandemic. But what comes next? I mean, where has the public health narrative gone now? We are not talking about building more hospitals and you know building elasticity in government health. Uh, and we have seen in now Ukraine also, Ukraine crisis has also exposed that number of Indian students are studying outside uh, medical studies. But uh, you know, suddenly the narrative for the government to do much more on health and you know public health especially has just gone away uh, as the COVID uh, spread is declining. So as public health professionals or people in the health space, what do you think about it? I think uh, you have raised a very pertinent issue that uh, we should not forget the, uh, like, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic would be over and hopefully would be over very soon. But for us, it should not be over unless the lessons learned and challenges identified are addressed by the government. So of course, the uh, health system need to be strengthened to tackle post-COVID situations, the mental health challenges which have emerged and many other weaknesses in the health system has been identified. All of those should be carried forward and addressed. It should not be forgotten with the Russia's invasion of Ukraine or any other challenge. So I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, we know that, I mean, people respond to immediate threats, right? So um, yeah, that's why governments have not truly mobilized to fight climate change because it's not an immediate threat. It's down the line at some point. And, uh, you know, and this is just human nature to ignore things until they're, you know, the, the wave is on you. Uh, so, you know, I'm not surprised. I agree with you that we need to be more proactive, but I'm not surprised that we're not being, and I have very little uh, faith that governments will, uh, you know, spend proper resources uh, to fight a pandemic that you know may come down the line in you know 30 years you know so it's not a surprise to me yes um i think the gentleman in the striped shirt the blue striped shirt uh, this now post covid there's a lot of uh, fear mongering happening that it may result into type 2 diabetes or cardiac problems so there's, there's a lot, lot of this happening in the media. In fact, in hospitals, I've seen doctors rather talking very happily about it. The fact is that even when the COVID was there, uh, I have seen in my acquaintances and circle that people who in the initial stages managed themselves at home were far better than those who went to the hospitals. Many of them died. And at that stage, there was, like in India, we have a regulator for financial system, but we don't have any regulator for hospitals. There was no control on what kind of drugs are being administered, what's happening to patients in the hospital. And so therefore this is, and if you see the stock market, we have three, four listed hospitals, all time high profits have uh, been earned by the hospitals during the COVID time. So I would like to know, I mean, is there a, some third independent, uh, whom to trust really? I mean, this is, there is a major, deficit of trust in the healthcare system itself. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think that, uh, I, I, I don't know if you are implying that the threat of COVID um, on, you know, uh, other chronic illnesses has been overblown. Um, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I can tell you as a cardiologist that um, 
there are uh, huge effects uh, on the cardiovascular system uh, from, you know, in post-COVID state or long COVID, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, so that I mean, that, that that's one thing. I don't think it's overblown. Um, the other issue is about how. Uh, you know, patients may be fared worse going into hospitals. I can't speak about the situation in the um, in, in India, but I can tell you that um, there was a lot of hesitancy to go into hospitals during the the waves uh, in in the U.S. And it's not it's nothing new. I mean, the same thing happened with Ebola in West Africa. Uh, you know, uh, West Africans stopped going to TB clinics. They stopped going into primary care clinics, and the number of indirect deaths. Uh, not directly related, not directly from Ebola, skyrocketed. Uh, same thing happened with COVID. So, so I would argue that actually uh, patients should have gone to the hospital more than they did uh, uh, during, you know, dur during waves. Just a quick 30 second intervention on this that I think I'm really impressed with the question you are asking. Two years ago, before the start of pandemic, we could not imagine that in a public discourse, uh, you would be asking, anybody would be asking about trust in health services question. So what pandemic has brought to the forefront the weaknesses of India's healthcare system, that need for trust, transparency, reducing the cost. So my only suggestion here is that, of course, there's a time limited. The suggestion is that we need to continue this dialogue, keep asking those questions at different fora, to the political leaders in the public discourse, and that's how things will change. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Really uh, great questions. Uh, there is one thing that I want to make sure that everyone in this audience understands that there may be minutia that uh, the public health professionals, uh, you know, are sort of discussed, but let there be no mistake that every one of us on this panel agrees that these regulated vaccines are good vaccines. Please get vaccinated if you can. There is no disagreement on this. I think we're being, uh, we'll just take one last question or should we, oh, I think we're, we're completely out of time. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Sandeep, Chandrakant, Barkha, Umbrish, and Pita. We thank the Embassy of the United States of America and India for the support. The authors will be signing their books at the book signing desk located on my left and your right. <laughs>